Do you consider this is from Rob Rob Damashuk, uh, hey, who Rob. is hosting thirty year thirty years thirty days <laughs> thirty years of martial arts? <laughs> you train an hour a day for the next thirty years, and uh, and then you get your fourteenth don <laughs> in whatever art you feel like disparaging right now, which we're not going to do. What? Question That's for the three of us. Do you consider yourself, quote, someone who does martial arts or do you consider yourself a, quote, martial artist? Yeah. Martial artist. Yeah, that was, um, I, I, I had determined the, the difference between people who do martial arts and people who practice martial arts. Hmm. So in my head, the guy was the, the practicing was the person who comes in on Tuesday because it's Tuesday and it's martial arts day. You know, it was the activity of the day. It wasn't, it wasn't as embedded into their lifestyle. Um, and that doesn't mean that people can't go back and forth between the two either. But I would say that I do martial arts. I don't practice it. The, mm -hmm. the martial arts practitioner is the one who just comes in on that given day to do whatever it is that day. It, it, they, don't, they don't take it home and do it... Uh, everything with it all the other stuff that comes along with it all the sure. reading all the the practice at home building a dojo in their basement you know whatever it happens to be yeah yeah i i've long struggled with with the language around this and you know like the verb what 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 is the verb that goes with martial arts is it is it do is it practice is it and and i've honestly i've, I've dodged it for a long time and there was a, a guest on the show not too long ago who used the word play Mm -hmm. very intentionally with that and initially i had a uh, a bit of a negative kind of a distancing reaction to it and the more he talked about it the more on board i became you know when i when i teach aikido um after we go you know demonstrate the technique a couple of times out and i purposely say now go play with it mm. right because right and I i've heard i've heard that that verb used in that way certainly i, I think it lessens the impact of this has to be right 100 percent of the time for the first time you do it mm. it's, no 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 this is an experiment go see what works what verb do you use i know i like play i mean if you play uh, piano you don't say i do piano right so we use play for i play soccer you don't say i, I do soccer so it only makes sense if you're a martial artist that you uh, you play martial arts uh, i like that <laughs> i don't think that's bad and I think all the, our teacher friend can tell us uh, officially, don't most studies show now that the uh, learning theory of play is, um, gets far better benefits than like the kind of the rote learning or other models of um, education. Is that right? At least with younger kids? Yeah. Uh, the only thing I would say is that play has a connotation of not being serious at the same time too. So it's saying that it depends on who you're talking to on what you would say, mm. you know, I wouldn't say to another martial artist that I play martial arts. That would seem to kind of downgrade it. It does, but, and I find that interesting because that's the first place that my mind goes. But then when we, we think about professional athletes, they all play their sport, they play their position. In that context, we don't diminish it. You know, we don't talk about Tom Brady as being the greatest of all time and that he does football. <laughs> he plays football. I mean, we can we can say those two things in the same, you know, in, in adjacent sentences, and one doesn't seem to diminish the other. So why is it that we instinctively go there? We go to a, a childish interpretation of the word play with martial arts, but we don't go there when we talk about pro athletes. Well, I guess, again, it depends on who's having that conversation. If I'm the owner of the team and I'm paying Tom Brady millions of dollars, <laughs> I don't want to come down on the field and have him say, yeah, I'm just playing around. I want him to say, I'm practicing. I'm going to win, <laughs> you know? Um, sure. And about what, uh, doctors, I, don't, I wouldn't want to go in to have a brain surgery with the doctor says, yeah, I'm just playing around with this new technique. I'd want him to say, I've practiced this technique. I can do this technique on your brain. Mm. So, uh, yeah, that's why we have different words in language. <laughs> but um, for point. the most part, I, if we're talking about the life and death of it, if I'm trying to market a uh, self-defense seminar, then I'm not going to say, hey, come on in. We're going to play around with chokes. You know, we're going to say, yes, we're going to practice self-defense techniques. Um, mm -hmm. But how do you get good at practicing? Well, you got to play around with this stuff and see what works for you and not take it completely seriously all the time. You have to allow yourself the freedom of making mistakes, which is what I think play opens up the door to. Practicing might mean, hey, I'm just trying to do this one thing the right way, the way Jared said, kind of even there's a, there's a 
there's a stigma like, no, I'm trying to make it right. Whereas play in, in, uh, suggests there's a freedom around the edges where you can kind of explore a little bit and it's okay to fall down and slip up because you're playing with it. Then you okay. can lock it in later and then practice what you learned while you were playing. So they're both, you know, they're, they both have a time and place, I think. I think it's almost like in the dojo, I want to say we play with it, but then any place that's not the dojo, you don't play with it. Hmm. Okay. Well, if you do martial arts, if you are a martial artist, <laughs> you're always in the dojo. So, and, and that was, and that was kind of part B on Rob's too. question was what is the difference between someone who does martial arts or someone who insert verb hears martial arts and someone who is a martial artist? Well, it's either, you know, it's either on your mind all the time or it's not. And I don't mean in a negative way, like I'm obsessed. I can't stop thinking, but you know, if you go to the gym and you lift weights, maybe you only go to the gym three times a week, week, but on your off days, you would still say, yeah, I, I lift weights, I work out. And there's an afterglow from having been there yesterday. I'm stronger today and I'm healthier today because of what I did yesterday. So I don't think it's fair to people who only get to go to a school twice a week or three times a week for martial arts class to say, like, well, on those off days and you're not a martial artist anymore, you can only be a martial artist for the hour or two that you're on the mats because there's an afterglow from having gone through the training. That's the whole point. You should be now carrying something with you outside of your class. And, and I think that's the important piece is, is how what happens inside of training impacts yeah. your life outside of training. Right. The better the class, the more that's going to stick with you, I think. The, uh, <laughs> the less important the class or the less meaningful or the less profound, then you'll forget. As soon as you, if you walk out the door of your class and you already can't remember what you did that night, then maybe you're just playing at martial arts and it's just something, it's a little hobby, it's something that gets you out of the house. But um, if you go to class and you have like a little emotional breakthrough or you really change your character somehow and that sticks with you in your business, in your relationships, when you get home, you need a minute to kind of calibrate, recalibrate your life. Then now we're talking, you're, you're beyond just hobby now. It's part of you. Right. And, and I like the analogy that you used about someone who lifts weights because I think that you, you can make a really concrete example there. What is the stereotypical weightlifter, right? They wear certain clothing, they mm. buy supplements, they carry around a jug of water, right? There, there's a, maybe a, a uniform, there's a personality, mm. there are actions that happen day to day. And I think we have those as martial artists, but I think mm -hmm. the challenge is that they can be very different. There isn't a universal way of being a martial artist outside of training. Yeah, that looks mm -hmm. terrible. <laughs> it, yeah, you know what to, it is? It's the, it's the backlight. Um, I, I know that you know. one. I was trying to avoid the camera angle, but I don't think it's working. It's can, just you, getting... can you rotate to your right at all? Oh, here. Let me turn on the light just in general. Okay. See, this is why it was hard to find a picture of Jared to begin with to make the little poster. I could not find a good picture of this guy. Well, that, why that's why you that's why you a good headshot. That's why you Photoshopped him <laughs> onto Indiana Jones, right? <laughs> that's right. <laughs> <laughs> no it's a good story on that hat we like that hat yeah that, that the one picture that's up there that's um last two summers ago uh in the rocky mountains national park so of cool. course i wear an indiana jones hat for that mm -hmm. of course <laughs> <laughs> next question uh from i'm guessing gabe could be his wife but gabe see you it would be great to hear a brief version of each of your origin stories and then answer the question, what was the most <laughs> influential event on your martial arts journey? You want me to go first? Yes. Okay, why because not? Because you, you volunteered by asking that question. <laughs> 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 the kid that raised his hand has to go first. Okay, so, <laughs> I don't know if it's typical or not, but mine was started by uh, pop culture of all things. Uh, the movie Highlander. Wow. Is what got me interested in swords in general. Um, you know, I, growing up, it's so my mom is a Middle Eastern dancer. She does belly dancing. Oh, and cool. She had a specialty dance she did where she bound swords on her head. So we always just kind of had swords lying around my house. Um, <laughs> Good parent. <laughs> well, nobody died, so I guess it's okay. <laughs> <laughs> I had a twin brother, but. <laughs> <laughs> um, I don't know. So I was just been having swords. Uh, and then finally I decided, you know what, I'm going to go figure out how to use these things. And my idea at the time was 
since Japanese swords are the greatest swords of all time, that's what I'm going to go learn how to use. Mm. So it, it's funny is that I actually went in for the swords and then stayed for all the Aikido part of it. <laughs> cool. That's my origin story is it was precipitated by belly dancing and Highlander. <laughs> love it. I love all that. Do you still believe the uh, <laughs> Japanese sword is the finest sword? It's very good at what it does, but every weapon is the best thing at what it does. Otherwise, Spoken it, like a HEMA guy. <laughs> <laughs> hey, I thought we weren't uh, deriding anybody. I'm not. I'm not. If, <laughs> if, you, if you watch the guests that Jared has on his show, there's a point like a year and a half ago that it takes this hard left and it's just, it's a lot of HEMA people. And I don't mean that in a negative way. It's great because I, I don't get very many HEMA people on, on our show. Well, I, it, it took me a long time to get to the point where, in my head, I thought HEMA was martial arts. Mm. But the more I researched it, I'm like, well, they do all the same things that traditional Asian martial arts do, so why shouldn't it be? Right. Sure. There are only so many ways the body can move. Yeah. Well, then you take belly dance and you go, oh, I didn't know <laughs> you could do that. I, I can just see Jared with the sword over <laughs> With the head. swords. <laughs> if that starts, I'm, I'm logging out, gentlemen. <laughs> Well, he's from the neck down, so we're good. We're good. <laughs> yeah. Just... Belly dancing without the belly. That's what I prefer. Thank you. There neck you dancing. Neck <laughs> dancing. <yeah. laughs> I've been watching a lot of Dave Chappelle. Can you tell? <laughs> <laughs> wow, that's good. So how about you, Ando? What was your uh, martial arts origin story? Oh, nothing fancy. I see that picture over your shoulder there of Bruce Lee on your wall, unless that's your dad or something strange no. going on. <laughs> Um, so yeah, pop culture for me too. That was, um, young man looking for a, a role model that wasn't uh, built like Arnold Schwarzenegger. And, um, Bruce was the guy. He's like, wow, he's cocky. He's confident. He's in control of himself. So, uh, I'd like some of that. What do I have to do? Martial arts. Okay. And so, uh, that was it. Did you go looking like specifically for JKD or? When Absolutely not. No, no, no. no. <laughs> well, no, because the I, the first thing I ever got was, uh, you know, Bruce Lee, um, the Dao Jeet Kune Do, and right off the bat, it's, you know, well, by the end of the page, at last page, it says, you know, don't make a fuss over the name. You have to kind of create your own thing anyway. So I never in a million years thought you should go looking for Jeet Kune Do. I thought he was telling you there is no Jeet Kune Do. It's up to you. So just go do your thing. So I never, ever had that cult of Bruce Lee other than I just liked him as a role model, as a human. He was open-minded. He was cross-cultural. He was looking at Western and Eastern. He was a philosophy major. I was a philosophy major. It was just like, okay, I just relate to this guy as a human being. Actually, I didn't really care for his movie fighting. I thought a lot of that stuff would look crazy and silly. Um, so, no, but I just, just as a starting off point, mm. Bruce Lee, for sure. Did, did but, you uh, read not that book before you started training? That's how I started training. It was a Bruce Lee's fighting method uh, that publisher mm -hmm. put together, like these little oh, okay, yeah. <laughs> photos. That was like my first official thing that I ever bought, like the blue one. And I said, oh, okay. And then eventually I found out about the Dao Jeet Kune Do. And I was like, oh, I get that. And so then I kind of worked through those pages and said, oh, okay. Um, and then I was in my garage for years until I finally said, okay, I need to go find a school. I've gone as far as I can in my garage oh, that's with buddies cool. and my brother or whatever. So, yeah. uh, and that was actually Steven Seagal. And when I, you know what? So what's so back to Rob, uh, I'm sorry, Gabe's question. The starting point for me, at least, was the Bruce Lee thing. But then it was Steven Seagal that convinced me that I can't learn everything in my garage. Because when I saw Above the Law, I had no idea what he was doing. I understood punches and kicks and throwing dummies around, but I didn't understand the flipping and the, the, the quick angles. I didn't understand what he was doing. That's the so movie I went he out does with the Aikido school. Was actually the first school I went looking for was an Aikido school. Was it on a submarine? Isn't that the movie with the submarine? No, no, that was later. I was under siege. But uh, above the law was the, all the, first all the Seagal movie. movies blur together for me. In a good way. <laughs> yes, in a great way. In the They're best way. They're all awesome. They're all awesome. <laughs> he did. Some, he did some good stuff. So, now, I know you started real early, Jeremy. I was four. Yeah. I was four. I spent the first year, maybe more, I don't know how many years, walking. It was a, a former small, you know, high school gym that had become a community center and beautiful hardwood floors with a lot of knots in the wood. And I would step from knot to knot. So sometimes I had really long stances. Sometimes my stances were not so long because that's, that's how I did it. Well, it does. Yeah. 
Uh, the fact that I was not beaten is is a miracle. Shout out to Sensei Beth and John for not beating me. Uh, I mean, they do now. They take it out on me now. I'm sure. I'm sure there was a lot of okay. He's 12 now. We can hit him. Uh, that that happened. And uh, what, what was part B? What Are you still B? training with the same people you started with when you were four? Is that what there you was a doing? hiatus? There was a 20 year hiatus. Oh, and but you're uh, reconnected with them. Yeah, now? yeah. Wow. They're um, they're in the woods in northern Maine. They have a beautiful space. And when they 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 winter in Florida, and they just got back because of what's going on. But mm. when they're around. I mean, I'm there usually once a month. It's a few hours wow. to get there, but it's, yeah, you know, you know the saying, you can't go home. Uh, I, I am, and it's, oh, that's great. It's, it's pretty, it's pretty awesome. Wow. What age did you start at, Ando? Uh, I don't know, early mid teens. Oh, okay. So I'm in there. Summer. I started uh, first year in college, so somewhere about eighteen, nineteen. Okay, good age. Good age. <laughs> Someone uh, on the – I'm keeping a track on the comments here. Thank you. Uh, Where are you guys looking? I don't see anything. What the there, – I'm, I'm looking on my phone. I'm cheating. Oh, okay. Yeah. Oh, yeah, it's not, it's not here. It's not this. <laughs> yeah, I don't know where to look. I'm it's sorry. <clears throat> you, so, you focus on being the one who's, who's professionally lit with wardrobe like and, and showing up with, with great Cock gear and, and intelligent conversation. <laughs> <laughs> and Jared and I will do all of the things that you're not supposed to do as part of this. <laughs> How's that? I think you guys are doing great. Thank you Thank for you. being here. Thank you. <laughs> what, what did you find, Jared? Someone asked, um, I missed the name because it went by too quick, but someone asked what their, our favorite katas were. Oh, I saw that. Uh, that's Craig. Okay. Favorite, favorite kata or I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to generalize it, favorite form and why. And uh, I think I went last on the, the last one, so I'll go, I'll go first this time. Um, it depends. It really depends on the day. Um, there are days that I can really appreciate Nahanchi, or, or uh, in, in some schools it's called techie, you know, the line. I can really appreciate the, the amount of nuance you have to put into that to realize what it's actually doing. And it's a it's a really popular form when people break down bunkai. Uh, and then there are days where it's it's uh, empi or kusanku, which were the forms that I competed with back when I, when I was competing. And because I've done those forms so many times, I feel like I know them so much deeper than any of my other forms. And I can just I, I feel like I can express who I am as a martial artist that much more completely in performing those patterns that I can doing say something else that i don't know as well beautiful that was like a love affair that was beautiful well thank you listening to that jared do you do kata um so aikido and <laughs> arts in general do it really different in that you have to have two man to do the kata there's except for weapons there's really not solo kata because it would just kind of look really funny <laughs> are you saying that jeremy looks really funny when he does his forms no those look good you know karate you have nice you know solid stances good moves aikido just kind of look floppy i guess you know <laughs> are you saying tai chi people look silly when they do their forms <laughs> i think he is they, they think, kind of look floppy is. i think i think jared's job tonight is to offend every martial artist regardless of style he's got a bingo card in front of him and he's like, all right, hold on. I made fun of, I made fun of a Akima down. Right, I got, I got, I got, all right, who's left? Oh, who's in the center square? Probably Hekla Doe. Sensei Anna. Um, so for me, it's just going to be a weapons form of some sort, um, just because that's generally the only forms that we have. How about you? Do you have a, cool. something that you prefer? Yeah, I prefer my own form. I've got my own. Do you? <laughs> that's what I do. Um, yeah, I mean, we went through the whole, when I was in Taekwondo, we did the Taekwondo forms uh, and karate. When I did the karate, like Kusanku was a cool form. I always liked that one. Uh, Naihanchi, just because it's so irregular and strange, uh, it's fun to study and it's, it's, it's very doable. It's not particularly athletic. So those are always cool standbys. Um, but uh, as I've gotten older, 
um, it's, I think it's become more important to make my own really personal connection with the form. And this could be a huge other conversation and whatever. But um, at this point, I've written my own form. And uh, that's the one I practice the most. And, uh, and because I don't have to ask anyone what the bunkai is or what's the right way to do it, it takes a huge amount of psychological pressure off so you can actually get, I think, to the good stuff that forms can give you, where I think a lot of people miss it because they're so concerned with doing it right or what does it mean and has it changed and, or I need this for a belt test. There's so many other factors that ruin the actual experience of just feeling and moving and getting to connect with your body that um, uh, I'm not a big fan I, of doing other people's I want to know anymore. everything about that. I really do. <laughs> I really do. Is it, is it more of a karate type form or? No, man. It's mine. Does it have it's a name? It's Ando form. <laughs> it's Ando one? It's Ando. Pinyon yeah. Ando? I mean, <laughs> it's been a project for as long as I've been doing martial arts, it's always been a, well, I have my little separate notebook. Like, well, here's a move I like, or gee, I need to feel these. I, it's an exploration, right? We were talking before about you're playing at your martial arts or you're practicing. And when you get to a form, I think most people would automatically put that into the practice portion because someone else wrote it and someone else is going to judge you on it and someone else is correcting you on it. So therefore it's everything that's not you. Hmm. It's your head is in a completely different spot than if it's just you painting on a white canvas. And I just want to paint a tree today and no one's there to hit my hand or tell me that it's wrong or that it sucks. I can tell myself what I wanted to do and whether I got there and I can come back tomorrow and make it better uh, on my own. I can ask coaches and how, how do you get that shading effect? I can always look for help. I do. That's what teachers are for. But for me now, a form should be something very personal because where do these forms come from in the first place? Where does Kushanku come from, right? It's, it's a tribute to this Chinese missionary, whatever, emissary, shipwrecked, blah, blah, blah. And these are the moves that we remember him doing, or this was the style that he was showing. Yeah. Why are there so many forms to begin with and so many styles of martial arts? Because each one is a representation of that person's wisdom and what their preferences were. And then everything got screwed up. Instead of learning one form that represented your family or your clan or your person, uh, suddenly it was like, oh, we have to know 12 forms or 20 forms. And one of them, like you're saying, MP versus Jite, you know, this one was kind of better techniques for a short, stocky person. This one was for a, a tall, whatever. Here's crane style. There's tiger style. I don't think you're supposed to be great at all of those. You're supposed to be getting better and better at refining which parts are you. Mm. And once you figure that out, then you can start playing with, well, what, now that I'm 50 or 60, which movements bring up the parts of me that I want to bring up? So- that's where the art comes in, creating your own form, I think, at some point. I think that's awesome. Has, has anyone, how do I phrase the question? Has anyone said, you can't make up your own form? You're silly. Don't do that. Because oh, there sure. are people, people out there. All kinds of stupid stuff. <laughs> <laughs> that's right. You, you've got a big YouTube presence. I'm sure you, you deal yeah, with a lot well, of they're it. mostly very nice people. But of course, everybody mostly. thinks they know everything and everyone's, and by the way, to be fair, I mean, it's easy to be snarky about that. But um, everyone's at a different stage of their development. Sure. So if you just started martial arts, you're three years in, four years in, you say, oh, you can't make up your own form. Who do you think you are? It's like, well, shut up. Train for 40 years and then come back and we'll talk. You don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> you have well, to learn someone else's form because you don't know what you're doing yet. So, you know, I'm not concerned about your opinion, really. So then how did you decide what was going to go into your form? Did you? That's uh, does experience. It every time you do it or? No, no. I mean, I have a, a set form that I do. That's my form as it stands now. I'll modify it as I move along. I have over the years. Um, because again, you have different goals, different things you want to work on. And some things that I feel that are so important, I, I never want to let go of. So those are going to be the most commonly uh, pieces that stay the same over time. But the, you know, the way you do it, the rhythm that you do it, all of that's where the play comes in. You can do your form, my form, your forms. You know, Some days you might do them very slowly. Some days you may do them for dynamic power some days you may do them just one of the moves over and over again because that's your body needs it that day um some days you're doing it just as one continuous flow with no accents no stops um there's so many different ways you can move your body that match up with different emotions and if people don't have the freedom to play with that then they are so limited in what they're doing even if you're going to use someone else's template you're going to do techie you're going to do kushanku okay but play with it because the guy who wrote it's dead. He's not here to tell you what to do. So you're taking secondhand, thirdhand information for what it means, what it's for, and what you should be getting out of it. 
at some point you have to take charge of it and say, I don't care what anybody says. Here's yeah. what I need to get out of this. Yeah. And I will test it out, my feedback, my theories, as I, you know, that's why we have sparring and partners. I'm not saying just sit in your basement and think you're the best, but at some point it has to become art. It has to be you. And, and you know, in the old days with karate, it wasn't just, oh, it's, uh, it's just Shotokan and everyone's the same. No, it was, it was Matsumura style. This is Itosu. This is, you know, each, you were identified by the family name of what kind of karate you're talking about. Um, it, and that should some- still be. If someone said, hey, I, I'm intrigued at this idea. I've been training, you know, a while. I want to make my own form. Like, what would you tell them? Go for it. Uh, and you don't have to throw out the other one. This is not a uh, either or. It's a both sure. and. Sure. You know, if you want to represent your style, whatever that style is, and perform those kata the way that they should be performed to represent that style, fantastic. But on the side, you should have this other project. Like, you know what? As a grown adult with experience, and my body can do certain things and I have a certain preference for certain techniques. I need to just remind myself of how I want to move and how I like to do things and what kind of things I visualize doing in a bad situation and uh, put that together. And by the way, I'm already, um, I'm already screwing up someone else's creation. Maybe for you, it's not about the bunkai. It's not about the visualization of techniques. Maybe it is literally just a physical form that you're trying to work your body through to open up whatever energies and flexibilities you want to have through your whole life but maybe for someone else, it is literally, these are my top 10 favorite self-defense moves. This is my throat grab. This is my groin grab. This is my whatever. And you're just the groin, so you never forget them. <laughs> Always restomp the groin. <laughs> Always. Yeah. You know, so, it kind of yeah. reminds me of, um, you know, you're talking about keep the art in it. It kind of reminds me of that at some point, if you're playing guitar, you play everybody else's stuff, but at some point you got to write your own solo. Yeah. That's sort of a thing. Well, you don't have to. But again, it's just, that's the difference between art maybe and a, a fan or what, what's the other word? Um, well, I'll tell you what. I mean, I had, no, see, that, that's too personal. Uh, <laughs> I'll screen that up. Some people are very natural at creating. Other people mm. are not. Mm. So it's not bad to say, I'm a huge Black Sabbath fan. Great. And you are a skilled guitar player. But at some point, you're going to be over your head when you get asked to go jam with someone and say, hey, mm-hmm. let's just riff and make up stuff and let's just jam. And you're kind of like trying to work in Black Sabbath riffs, riffs into the jam session. Like, well, we kind of heard that before. That's a different skill set. And I think it's just important to recognize which one are you – Which what is your goal? Are you trying to be the greatest exemplar of Shotokan or Taekwondo or a particular branch of those styles, which proves my case right off the bat that there's more than one of all of these things? Um, or <laughs> – are you, is your main goal to really know yourself and create something of your own and be your own thing? Because you know you can never, how can you please someone who's already dead? They don't even know what you're doing with your, the forms. Itosu's not here. He doesn't know what you're doing with the, with the Pinan Kata. Mm. <laughs> what? He doesn't care. True. Totally. Just thoughts. How often do you guys do, we'll say, partner work versus solo work? I was going to say kata, but, you know, or forms, but, you know, Jared already made it pretty clear that he hates forms and thinks they're stupid. <laughs> I, heard, I heard him say that. And, and if, if it's not directly applicable to self defense, then yeah, you shouldn't it. do it. <laughs> we, can make, we can make you that guy in this group. Otherwise, it's just dancing. I'm sorry. <laughs> well, that's a good question. So, Jared, because Aikido, I mean, I, I practiced Aikido for a little while, practiced, um, I didn't have enough time to play with it. Um, uh, when you don't have a partner, how do you develop your skills? So, like I said, we do have weapons forms, and a lot of that is moving your body the same way that you would if there was a person involved. Um, it's still teaching the same principles as far as angle, as far as how to move, move in circles. So the weapons forms are designed to See, Aikido is a weird thing. It's an unarmed armed <laughs> system in that it's meant to be an armed system without weapons. <laughs> yep. Yep. So a lot of the weird things that people make what? about Aikido. <laughs> I uh, let, me, let me try to explain, okay? So a lot of the Please. things people make fun of with Aikido, you know, like the famous one is like, well, here, grab my wrist. Well, in a fight, is anybody going to grab your wrist? No. But – if I have a knife in my hand, people would grab my wrist to try and stop me from doing something. 
So that's where the Aikido moves come in is with weapons involved. So Aikido is really effective when you attack people with a knife. I like that. <laughs> You'd be surprised. You that, have to start I, your self-defense by stabbing someone with a knife. And as long as you do that, Aikido works great. That's, what I, that's my takeaway here. So stab people and turn in circles. There, you're good. <laughs> I'm surprised there isn't like a, a variant of a wooden dummy for Aikido, for Aikido? honestly. It, you know, it, with like some, some angles on those, on those arms. Aikido has to be moving is the thing. Static Aikido does not work. I, and I'm the person to say it. it. The techniques won't work if there isn't movement involved. If you and I are in, on the dojo floor and I go, I'm going to do this technique to you and you don't want me to, it won't work. There's nothing I can do to make it work. There has to be movement involved on your part. Well, that's when you punch them in the nose to make them move, right? Atemi? You can do stuff like that, sure. Atemi, uh, I mean, oh, since I... Actually, I've heard that there's a quote, and I've heard the percentage change each time I hear it, but, you know, he said 90% of Aikido is a Temi. Right. So I've also heard it 85, 75, whatever. But. So in other words, 90% of Aikido is karate. <laughs> 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 oh, only, only the effective part. 90% of what's part. effective in Aikido That's is right. karate. Aikido other, comes in for the sweet little finish, little bow on top after karate's done the job. <laughs> the, other, the other 10% is wearing a skirt. Yeah, that's right. Look at that <laughs> Little belly dance at the end. Gotcha. <laughs> That's a sword. <laughs> Bringing it back. I like it. Back when I used to compete, uh, I, I used Psy for a few years and, and wanted to mm. try something different. So I switched over to a sword and wore a Hakama while I competed. And it was, it was great. I was like, they're fun. I don't, I'm not wearing pants under this. This is amazing. <laughs> oh, no. It was wonderful. It was like, woo. Now I get it. So, <laughs> no, 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 you wore pants under your hakama. <laughs> I wore a kilt under my hakama. <laughs> oh, well, you, so, you, you, you know that officially you're not supposed to wear anything under a kilt, right? Just look safe. Yeah. I mean, that's, <laughs> ooh, that's itchy. <laughs> um, so historically what a hakama is, is those are riding breeches. Those are like leather chaps, essentially. Cool. Do you wear leather chaps as well? <laughs> only when I'm doing Aikido. Solo. Only during his solo practice. His solo play. Oh, my God. This is getting bad. <laughs> it's, it's getting a little rough. It's almost blue. I think we're, you know. We're, please, we've got... please, Jared, you have to have a podcast episode named Under the Hakama. <laughs> I feel like it could be a whole show. <laughs> it could be about exposing something in the martial oh, arts. Under the, the dark underside of martial arts. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. There was, there was almost a spit take there, Jared. Good. <laughs> yes, that was close. You're brave drinking on the show. Is that beer? It looks like beer. No, no, no. That was just uh, soda. Just for caffeine. I see. I see. Um, one of the things I find interesting, you know, we, have, we all have podcasts. We've been on each other's podcasts. We have three martial arts podcasts, but anybody who is well acquainted. <laughs> Are you doing the permutation math? Yes. Is that the squinting? Okay. I'm trying to, what? Wait. Yes. I'm with we, you. We, we did. We did. I, I want to see if you come up with the same thing. There's only, there's only one thing that hasn't happened. So for instance, I've been on Jeremy's podcast. He's been on mine. Here it comes. <laughs> okay. Here it comes. Okay. Jared, I'm, I was meaning to ask you. <laughs> you haven't answered your email. <laughs> I'm hoping you can come on and be a guest on the podcast. I just wanted to update my software so you can come in in high def. I only have this old Mac right now, but I'm getting a new one. As soon as I get the new software, please, I want to talk about it. This was all a four-month plan that we, that we laid to get Jared on Fight for Happy Life. We were messaging like three years ago on Twitter or something like that. And that right. apart. Wait, I do. I'd like to come on and talk about how karate is the secret of Aikido. We must start with that. And now, and now the episode has to be titled Under the Hakama. <laughs> Karate yes. is the secret of Aikido. <laughs> um, our shows are all really different. And, and I, I think that as I've gotten to know the two of you, the differences in our shows are a direct reflection of who we are as people. And I'm wondering if you've noticed that and if you, like I, have... You know, because we've been, we've all been doing this a while. You know, you take a step back, you take a step out and look back at 
what you have done, who you've spoken to, what you've talked about, and realize that it's a pretty good reflection of who, I'm saying I've noticed about this about me, it's a pretty good reflection of who I think I am as a human being and as a martial artist. Well, I listen to knows anytime I want to feel happy about myself, so. <laughs> yeah. I don't know if that says anything but about Ando, but anytime I feel good, I'm like, I got to listen to Ando. <laughs> I do the same thing. This guy's great. Who is this guy? <laughs> sure, memory loss. I presume, so then you're saying, uh, Mr. Jeremy, that you're, uh, you're proud of the body of work that you've already, because you do, obviously, you're the most heavy duty podcaster here. Um, Prolific, I think, is the to word to use. Seven, how, yeah, how many episodes now? Seven We're billion, coming up seven? on 500. Seven billion. Yeah, you're 500, <laughs> right? That's incredible. What, have you, what can you give other uh, podcasters and people out there? Uh, what's your number one tip having done 500 episodes? Do more learned? than everyone else. <laughs> oh, I'm just, I'm just kidding. <laughs> the look on your face, that was worth it. No, uh, it, it's go back. It's it's like martial arts. It goes back to the basics, right? I did the show for a while and realized that my twenty five dollar headset, which is in like a bin over there, was no longer the right tool. I had progressed from that tool, and it was time to do something better, like this microphone. Mm -hmm. uh, we are at the point now where if we spent the money, you know, if I, if I dropped, I mean, the next step up on a mic is like five, 600 bucks and mm -hmm. it's not going to be worth it in the quality. But what we start, what we did over a year ago was I hired a, a part-time producer to help book guests and do other things like that. And so really it's just been that, that iterative model that I think shows up in, in most everything in life, but you know, we're talking about martial arts. So it shows up in martial arts. You know, you, you practice a, a, a straight punch 10 million times and then you learn, oh, my shoulder's been out of position or I've been doing this wrong this whole time. Now I've got to go back and how do I make that better? And as you make that better, it makes everything else you've done better. How do I become a better interviewer? You know, how do I become, where, where are they? I have these sheets. You know, I take notes while I'm, recording an episode you know I, I that this sheet yeah but i i've got i've got boxes to fill out and things you know because our, our interview episodes have have some structure to them and over the years that form has changed you know so it's just this constant evolution i, I don't think i don't so think there's a, a magic formula to it well, I mean, we listen to a lot of podcasts that are, are easy to turn off. Sure. Um, most, of, I would so, say most of them. Oh, there we go. Go for it, Jeremy. Oh, no. Tell no. everybody why everybody else's podcasts suck. <laughs> it's, it's like music, okay? There's a lot of great music, but most music sucks. Wow. There are a lot of great podcasts. Let's, but there are also okay. a lot of podcasts. And. Yeah, most podcasts suck. Name three. Quick. Nope. Zero. Marshall no. Thoughts. Not. Huh? Marshall Thoughts. No, I listened to your show. Stop. No, th honestly, the beginning ones sucked. Like you were saying, they got better. My beginning ones sucked. We've <laughs> all gotten better. Nobody, I'm sure if we went back and we looked at, I mean, he's, he's, we've talked about him already because you can't have a martial arts podcast without discussing Bruce Lee. <laughs> you can't. It just doesn't happen. Um, if we went back to Bruce's first day of doing martial arts, of playing martial arts, I'm sure he would suck. And nobody would ever, if you, if you had video of him on day one and you posted it now, no one would believe it was him. You'd have, you'd have two camps. 80% of people would say, There's, this is Photoshop, no way this is him. And the other 20% would say, well, that must be how we do this because it's Bruce Lee. Take it as gospel. Yeah, exactly. You know, the, the, uh, it's like if you look at uh, Shimabuku, who founded Ishinru, the only video of him doing the kata, he's drunk <laughs> because he wouldn't do it. So they got him drunk. And I've seen the video, and they're awful. And anybody who looks at that, if, if you're checking it for anything other than what's that next move, if you're trying to use it as this is the gospel of how I should do this form, it's silly. 
Well, that brings up a much bigger issue about the value of forms and what should you be looking at when you see someone do a form? Audio quality. <laughs> was he keying loud enough? That guy was too quiet. He must suck. <laughs> how about you? So, so same question. You know, we're, we're talking about how our shows have, have changed and what you've learned and what you would tell other people. Um, you know, I used to just say, Hey, just do it. But eh. <laughs> I think it's really nice. Uh, just being you is always great. Having a decent mic is really great. And being able to kill your babies is really important. Um, and I'm, that's the one thing I'm trying to get better at in this. Uh, I think I know what you mean about that, but others might not. And I think Jared just threw up in his mouth a little. <laughs> um, I, for every podcast episode I've got out, I've got about three or four outlined that I'm probably oh, really? never going to record wow. because I'm like, you know, it's just not like, compelling enough. I don't feel like it. Or eh, I keep looking at that one. I just don't want to do it. It's not, time's not right. Um, or, you know, in the old days I used to write uh, like the first 40 or so of my podcast. I'm up I remember you saying that and that blew my mind. All written down and I was really careful about everything I was going to say. And I wanted because, because I respected the listener. I really wanted to value people's time. If you're really going to, out of your busy life, if you're going to click on my face and say, I want to hear what this guy's got to say, I wanted every word to be worth it. And I really hated, I still do, when I click on someone else's podcast and you hear them like opening up a can of something and they're sitting around just like, uh -huh, and they're just laughing with each other. And you're like, you know, guys, I got stuff to do. I gave you a couple of minutes here and you're not even valuing my time. So I'm gone. I got to go. Yep. So that is the one thing, but that means killing your babies. That means I might be listening back if I wrote something back in the old days and it was like a 5,000 word script. And I say, you know what, this section, now that I'm re-listening to this, it's, it's, I think this is redundant. I need to cut this part out. Make that edit, cut that part out, and just say wow. that's the way it's got to be. And I'll tell you the stupid thing is, even now with videos, because I've kind of moved more into video than yeah. uh, podcasting, um, but it's when I, when I kind of make the one-minute version of like a, a video that's eight minutes or ten minutes long, but for Instagram, you have to kind of make it a minute or you know something for Twitter a minute. And when I cut down something into a minute, I always think like, you know, that could have been the whole damn video. Why did I make that eight <laughs> or nine minutes? <laughs> You know, it's so much better this way. So, but there are some people who like to process and think and hear it a couple of different ways. And other people just, what's the point? So again, that's the right. beautiful thing. Uh, you can have the best of both worlds. You can do the short version, do the long version. Um, I think you should make that available as a podcaster. Make sure you're open to that kind of the Gary V model. Hmm. Don't just do one thing one way in this day and age. If you really want to reach people, maybe you don't have your show and make that one. If you want a three hour show, great. But then if you want to hire an editor or do it yourself and go through and kill some of those babies and get it down to a 20-minute one, get it down to a five-minute one, and then put those out on different formats, fantastic. Uh, then you have a way to reach everybody on their terms because not everybody's got – like some people might be an auto mechanic and you want to listen to a show like Joe Rogan's show. You don't care if it's three hours, four hours long because you're going right. to be in the shop all day. You just want some company. That's okay. But other people, hey, I got a half-hour lunch break here. I just want to hear something for five minutes. So let me put in the Chris Wilder show and maybe that, that'll be enough for right now. You know, so there's something for everyone. So I think as a smart podcaster, it's great when you can kind of, you know, have something for everybody. I'm, more, I'm a one-man show, so I have not taken that, my own advice on that. But if I ever get someone on board, that's one of the first things I'm going to do. Go back to all my old content, find some snippets that you can break out, and then create like a whole separate channel of those. Hmm. Okay, I'm done. Sorry. Jared, why, why did you say your early episodes suck? Um. It wasn't focused enough. Um, if you, I don't know how much, when you guys started listening, but way back when there was like four of us uh, kind of just sitting around in the dojo afterwards. Um, once I moved up to Nashville, I moved away from, you know, the original host the, with me. Uh, I was able to do it, I hate to say it this way, but 100% my way. Mm -hmm. So I was able to focus in exactly on what it was I wanted to talk about and and who i wanted to talk to so there was a shift in the style of the show um as opposed to like a i don't know a morning you know drive to work fun show what it was kind of at the beginning the morning zoo crew type of thing mm -hmm. uh i've slowly shifted it over time to be a really in-depth 
look at a lot of weird academic stuff about martial arts. Which is what I appreciate about, about what you do in your show. And it's why I listen to your show. I, um, I'm sure we all listen to other podcasts and non-martial arts content, but I don't listen to a lot of martial arts podcasts. I listen to your shows because you're my friends and because you keep me trying to push forward. I don't know why that's funny. I was crying. Oh, oh, you it looked humorous. <laughs> <laughs> oh, what a jerk. I'm not this guy's friend. Uh, but there are, I mean, there are shows out there that, you know, just like you said, and I've stopped checking them out when they first go live mm. because I'm not going to invest myself in a show and suffer through those early episodes as they figure things out mm. when it takes, you know, five, 10 episodes for them to really get, get a groove going. And once they do, yeah, then I'll, then I'll check it out. But I find more often than not, even with martial arts content, like you were saying, that it, it's a group of people thinking that they're going to monetize hanging out and drinking. Beer. Right. Oh, that's a good one that you just said that. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, yeah. you know what? I'm not monetize. I'm, I'm barely able to monetize anything that we do. And I don't, do any beer drinking during our show i mean this is a can of soda I'm not even sponsored for this this seltzer that i'm drinking <laughs> i get free books. full price wasn't even on sale at the store <laughs> <laughs> it's it's long tail right i mean it's a tie into other things i mean i i would assume you both felt that if you take a look at the value that you've taken from what you've invested it's I mean, if, if you if you put a dollar amount on what you've invested in your show, you're you're way below minimum wage. But what about the connections and the experiences and the way that it's enhanced your martial arts and your understanding? I mean, I, I have I have friends throughout the world because of what we do. Right. And how crazy and cool is that? Yep. Yeah, in your hometown, you might be the only weirdo, but thanks to the, this kind of stuff. <laughs> You've got an army of weirdos you can That's align right. with. So, it's, yeah, it's very great. It's great. That's right. Um, Jared asked me a question while we were apparently not getting sound check right <laughs> before you came on. <laughs> and I'm curious if, if you've had the same thing that Jared's question was if I had been recognized because of the show. And I'm wondering if you have. Wow. Is an audio format, you've been, have you been recognized I from have. an audio show? I have. That's incredible. Well, because of you're tied into other things, obviously. Um, I, was uh, I, I was stopped in a crowd. Are you the guy that does the podcast? Nice. Yeah. Wait, did they say it like that? Just the podcast? There was, there, it, it, wasn't, it wasn't like a derogatory question. No, I mean, it, you can it wasn't like pretty much any group nowadays and go, hey, are you the guy that makes <laughs> videos on Instagram? Like, yeah, it yeah. was a few years ago. <laughs> Truthfully, it was, I think it was three fishing. years ago. It's fishing. <laughs> Catfishing. Oh, you are that guy who does that podcast. Listen, I got something to sell you here. Hey, you sign here. Yeah. <laughs> You've been recognized at all, Ando? Yeah. Yeah, a couple of times. Nice. Um, standing in the middle of the street once, talking to some guys after a workout, and a car pulled over. And, the guy, and I was just, you know, nothing special. The guy came over, hey, I know you. <laughs> Aren't you Ando? I'm like, holy smokes. I thought the guy was going to stab me. I didn't know what was going on. I thought he did Aikido. I thought I was about to get stabbed. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> <laughs> and then just recently, yeah, I put it on my Instagram because I was just so flattered. Uh, it's only happened a couple of times, but um, that's it. Someone comes walking up like, oh my gosh, you're the, you're the guy. I'm like, yeah. And you're the guy who smiles. Well, that's a nice thing to be remembered for. I don't mind that. But this is why it's difficult because if I'm sitting around, I'm yelling it with my wife. And then some guy goes, hey, happy life guy. What? <laughs> Get out of here. So. Yes, but the answer is yes. Uh, Jared, do you have a, a cult following on the campus <laughs> Um, Again. People flying over from Europe now that you're a HEMA yeah. file? Yeah, I did it for like one semester. It's not like I'm doing HEMA, but um, I went to uh, Combat Con, which is a <laughs> martial arts convention. Oh. And I was a presenter on martial arts podcasts. And while I was in watching another presentation a guy recognized me i guess by my voice he must have but nice so that was actually pretty cool nice yeah. he's not really into hema he just goes to conventions 
Well, like uh, theoretically, I'm doing one the the same combat con in August, and I'll be doing it on Japanese swordsmanship for them. Nice. So, give Did them you say theoretically, you're going. Well, you know, with Corona, Theor- theoretically, August. we're all doing things. Oh, yeah. I see. <laughs> because that, man the, the more to Mars, <laughs> the more things get pushed back. Yeah, we'll exactly. A lot of hours of daylight savings time to fix this. Ah, <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. What, um, I mean, we did have some, you, Jared, you jotted some questions, didn't you? About yeah, actually, things uh, related to the, the current climate. Because uh, someone I, just put up on if you want to go for this one. Uh, Robert Escobar just asked <laughs> if we have a favorite esoteric technique that you think is very practical. I don't know what he means by esoteric. What's an esoteric technique? Well, maybe something that's not commonly taught or, you know, a punch to the face everybody knows. But um, right. Oh, then I, I oh. do have one. Okay. Um, pulling up on the bridge of the nose. The because filtrum. It, the filtrum? Is that what that's called? The uh, filtrum. Yeah. Okay. Pulling up on the filtrum. <laughs> Excellent. Because it, it, it breaks people's balance. And so when I teach self-defense, I don't teach eye gouges and throat rips and groin stomps i teach pulling up on the filtrum and pinching the eye inside of people's thighs and and stuff I'm that not, i'm not sure i like the judgmental tone in that uh, gouging eyes and uh, grabbing throats uh, comment um, okay well you go defend yourself from a knife wielding attacker who's killing your wife using aikido well, you go do it the nice way okay <laughs> no it's not it's not meant to be judgmental uh, sounded like it it probably did <laughs> It probably did. It's it's eight o'clock and, and I want a glass of scotch. Oh, go for it, please. Don't let us no, stop. No, no, no. I'll be a whole no, different this podcast. this would go sideways. This would be under the hockey. Under the hoodie. <laughs> yeah. I mean I <laughs> No, but here here's my issue, and, and I did an episode on this. Um, but my issue is that there are people who will say, Okay, I'm gonna take thirty minutes, I'm gonna show you how to rip throats and gouge eyes. And forget about the psychological piece where most people will wait until it is too late to deploy those movements. Because they're like, uh, I I don't know. Like, is he trying to kill me? I'm not sure. And by the time they're sure, it's too late. And so I think it's important to have some movements that you can deploy. And you're like, oh, you were just looking for some money. I'm sorry I ripped your throat out is a lot worse than, oh, I'm sorry I pulled up on your philtrum. Hmm. So you're saying those are more um, uh, less injurious and and easily available techniques at the same time. Yeah, people people aren't gonna aren't, aren't gonna wait to deploy. Yeah. and and I think it's an important aspect of the toolbox. It is not the entirety of the toolbox. So if we're talking esoteric, that's that's my answer. Man, that's one of the craziest things I've ever heard. Okay, moving on. <laughs> you have anything, Ando, or spitting? Yeah, spit in his face. Okay. It's, you can close range with it really quickly. It makes them blink, flinch. Nobody likes it. Nowadays, it probably could kill somebody with coronavirus. Do you so, practice uh, it? Do you spitting. practice spitting sure. yeah, for accuracy absolutely. and distance? Well, it doesn't have to be too accurate. With watermelon seeds, yes, I can do pretty good. I can take out an eye. <laughs> I can take out, I can hit you right in the filtrum with a watermelon seed, my friend. <laughs> I can break a board. If you give me a, a big enough uh, butternut squash, I could probably break a board or two. Hubbard squash has some. <laughs> Big old seeds. Yeah. I had, a, I had a sensei that would, uh, he goes, now I'm going to teach you a technique. And he would go like this and then just walk towards the person. Oh, oh. gross. And it, <laughs> he wouldn't do but it. It works. It's just Exactly. That was his it works. Point. He goes, now they're running away. That, um, when, when <laughs> I, don't, people, I don't know if that's an esoteric <laughs> technique, but. <laughs> when people say, how would you defend yourself against like five guys? I, I mind putting my hand down the back of my pants and like, and taking my hand out. Good Lord, man. Because that's Good gross. Lord. Nobody wants to mess with that, right? <laughs> that's, that's my best shot at getting out. <laughs> oh. <laughs> I've spent a lot of time thinking about this stuff. That's excellent. No, psychological warfare. That's a big that's part. Right. You're right. It's not all sidekicks. I like how I brought the conversation to a screaming halt. How do you, what are you supposed with that? to say I mean, to what's, I, I... I'm worried about your mental health at this point. <laughs> I, I haven't, I live alone. I haven't been spending much time with other people for a while. (laughs) There's been a lot of zoom calls. 
Um, I'm not at the point where I've, I've done any of them pantsless yet. Can you, I don't want to ask you to prove that right now by standing up, but I'm going to take well, your I'm, word on I'm that. definitely wearing pants. It's cold. It's April in Vermont. Yeah. Hand yep. check. Everybody make sure you have two hands up. All right. <laughs> okay. Thank you. It's still cold enough that the, that the, the maple trees are running. So. Mm. Oh, very nice. Do you make syrup? Um, I, sadly enough, only learned this year that the maple trees in my yard were appropriate to tap. I thought you had to have sugar maples and come to learn, no, you don't. Any maple tree will work. And mm. I have these huge, beautiful red maples. And I went, all right. And I went down to the, the store and I grabbed some buckets and wow. um, in one day pulled out close to a half gallon from one tree of, of sap, which wow. it's, yeah, it's nuts. It's nuts. And I believe uh, so Whistle I'm, Kick has a brand new product here. It takes so much work to boil. Uh, I just, I just drink it. I prefer the sap. Just some, yeah. I've never tried that. Well, it's, it's not economical to ship around, but there are, we, we have a couple companies in Vermont that are trying to make maple seltzer a thing, mm. but it's, it's quite tasty. I mean, it's, it's, it, I would it, imagine it's sweet, but does it still taste it is. like it's, maple? It's like, like water with a hint of maple. It's like maple, you know, this, if, this, if this is water with a hint of lemon, you know, it's water with a hint of maple. But oh. there's all kinds of good stuff in it that when you boil it, you kill. You know, lots of enzymes and whatever. It's, it's healthy. It's tasty. Cool. Yeah. Also get a Vermont uh, biology lesson too. Right. <laughs> right. Hey, I mean, what's, what's better than that? Well, one of the questions we had kind of written down uh, because we were talking kind of in the, you know, the time of Corona here is can online teaching substitute for teaching or is it only for supplements? Because for a long time, people have said, you can't learn martial arts from a book. You can't learn martial arts online. But now they're all stuck. We're like, well, here's a book on martial arts. Here's a, an online video for martial arts. Buy my book, buy my DVDs. Right. <laughs> Subscribe to my YouTube channel. So yes, please. <laughs> All of the above. Yes, please. <laughs> There's your spit take. <laughs> I mean, I don't have DVDs, but I, I definitely have the others. <laughs> so, so what is the value for online teaching for martial arts? You know, we talked about, you know, you mentioned the kata, but if you're drunk, does it matter? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, of course, online is helpful. Of course it is. When I was a kid, um, I, I was, you know, a lost teen. Uh, looking for direction, like I said, and Bruce Lee was an inspiration, but I didn't have any money. I didn't have a car. Uh, all we had, there was no internet. So back then, you know, I'd walk to the library, you'd find some old um, Bruce uh, Tegner or Tenger book on, mm -hmm. you know, whatever. And you're looking at kind of some drawings and old photos and all kinds of terrible, well, not terrible books. I mean, but you know what I mean? Not a lot. So in that era, can you learn from these books how to do a judo throw? No, not so much. Um, so nowadays, if I'm a still, if I'm a kind of lost young person and I'm looking to get into martial arts or something about it that's calling to me, the fact that you can go on to YouTube or the internet and find scholarly articles and historical things and videos and demonstrations and courses and one-on-one uh, -on -one video chats and lessons, the guidance and mentorship and teaching abilities, the teaching capabilities is, it's miraculous. And no master in the history of martial arts China, Japan, Korea, I don't care where you are, HEMA, whatever you're talking about, has ever had a resource like this. So I, I think it's ridiculous if anybody ever puts down the internet or video as a valid teaching tool, because I guarantee if the Shaolin Temple had access to the internet back then, there's no reason why they wouldn't have said, yes, here's the chief abbot, we wanted him to show you this form, here's his monkey form, you should have this recorded somewhere, whether they keep it, they had books, so why not have videos? I mean, it's just... Either you want to learn or you don't. If you want to learn, you're going to use every tool possible. So um, the only question is, what is that enough and how much and how do you use it? Of course, that's a big other discussion. But please, absolutely, incorporate videos, books, conversations, podcasts. All of this should be enriching uh, your martial arts journey for sure. You, you, there, there sounds to be a little bit of fire in, in your answer there. Am I picking absolutely. up Absolutely. Okay. Because I wish right. I had had this when I was a kid. That's all. It, 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 it sounds like it's more than that, though. It sounds like you're... you're and I wish for every kid in the world to have it now. Okay. That's why I'm, I'm trying to do something. When I got to a certain age, I'm like, you know what? What changed my life the most? Martial arts. That was an investment that has never failed me. People disappoint. 
this degree doesn't guarantee a job, any families this way or that way. Okay. But every minute I put into martial arts, it pays me back. I've never been disappointed with the effort I put into martial arts. It is the best investment you can make. And like I, I said, when I was a younger kid, I didn't know where to put that energy and that spirit and how to get where to invest my time and energy. I had, oh, I got these Bruce Lee books, but that wasn't much. I'm sitting there trying to do chi sao on a ladder in my garage. What is this? I don't know. You know, I no, no one to ask a question to, no one to buy a course from. So nowadays, the fact that I can be part of a, a growing body of smart, wise, good people who can offer that 13-year-old out in the jungles who doesn't have access to anything but a phone and that you could talk to that person and email that person and send them a video and give feedback and tell them they're heading in the right direction or not. Hey, stop doing that kind of training. You're going to hurt your shoulder or, hey, do this. That's going to help you more. And I, I know what you're doing. I mean, come on, this is the best usage of technology possible and I'm happy to be part of it. I'm only frustrated because I want to do more. I still got mm. a day job and you know, got your things we got to do, but, um, but that's the dream, right? Before I die, I'm trying to just be one of those people who can, people can feel comfortable coming to with their questions, with their journey and say, what do you think about this? And I can say, well, I might be able to help you. Maybe not. Um, I have some resources available. Here you go. Um, I just, I would like to die having left that. So it sounds like you want it to be a, a, a supplement, not the, the main source of information, though. Well, that's up to the, every person, right? If I had had, um, I mean, it depends on how you use it and what kind of information you're looking for and what your goals are. Obviously, if you want to be a black belt in Brazilian jiu-jitsu, you can't do that on your own in a garage. Um, that's just not possible. If you're trying to just start to take control of your body, like I was, that was my first goal. I didn't think about the wisdom of the martial arts and the life-changing aspects. I just wanted to get in jail. Bruce Lee, he's in control. He's cocky. He's confident. I want to be like that guy. So it starts off for me with physical fitness. So for a while, for years, that was enough. But then at some point I said, well, I need more though. Now I need technical information. I, I don't know, understand these flips and wrist locks. What, what, I don't know what that is. So now I have to go find a teacher. And then at some point that wasn't enough. I wanted the next thing. And then you keep searching and searching and searching. But again, back then you had to drive around. And if you didn't have that school, then you were just screwed or Panther videos in the back of some magazine. Like I can't afford all these videos and how good are these going to be? I don't know. But, um, so it depends on what someone's looking for. If they have a training partner that they can work with, maybe there's, I think those, uh, like those Gracie garage things are a fantastic use of modern technology where you can enroll. I mean, I'm not doing a plug because I'm not even a Gracie student, but I admire that model of saying, here's like a, a source of like the, the big university. Here's a bunch of videos. And then we encourage you to have little garage groups where you have some buddies that can come over and practice this stuff. Yeah. And we'll even make a list of those things worldwide. So if you're in a town, you want to go visit someone's garage, you can go train with those people and create this community of all these like-minded people um, that would never have had any connection with anybody before. So I'm, I'm rather half full than half empty kind of guy. I would rather have, if all you can do is video, then just do video. If you can do video in a seminar once a month and travel a little bit, then do that. If you can get to a school twice a week and do some video, great, do that. If you can be in a video, a, a classroom every day and have training partners every day, then you probably don't need video but you still might want to listen to a podcast and meet some people like this. So it all depends on your formula. What are you looking for? How much do you think? The same thing. I like that one. That's all I got. I, I think we would all, <laughs> I, I think we'd all agree that in-person instruction is more effective, assuming a quality instructor. But how much, I mean, I, I grew up, you know, everybody disparaged books. Everybody disparaged learning from videos. You know, that the, the video VHS yourself, mail in the tape, you know, for your, for your next rank sort of courses. How much of that was trying to protect the martial arts schools and, and you know, sort of the, the, it really coming from the same place as don't go train anywhere else. You can only train with me. Well, I think in general, martial arts is... Well, it's had a problem of secrecy. Mm -hmm. You know, we've always, because it comes from this wartime idea, and if the other people know what techniques I like to do, well, then that means they can defeat me and, you know, kill my village type of thing. Which became, I can't teach you this move because it's too deadly and you're right. not ready for it. Right. So there's a lot of secrecy that's traditionally been in martial arts. Mm -hmm. But I think most of us realize that this is not, a secret thing anymore this is this is for betterment this is for self-defense you know nobody is mm -hmm. 
nobody's going to be, you know, karate chopping on the battlefield, so to speak, anymore. So I, I think once we got over that secrecy idea, now all the flood of books, all the flood of videos on the internet, you know, I don't have to hide what I'm doing anymore. Right. Yes, you do. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, now more than ever. That's why I don't put my form on video. <laughs> That's why I talk about how to punch straight. These are the That's videos why we, that most people want. That's why the first uh, actual, it took years, but the first thing we actually put out that said, here's what you do for training is a strength and conditioning program. It has nothing to do with technique because I am terrified of putting anything out on technique. Yeah, and you should be. <laughs> Because you're teaching people how to grab the filtrum, so <laughs> that sounds much. Better. It works, man. It works. <laughs> Not on me, baby. <laughs> I could take. I could take the smallest child if they could. Re if they can reach your nose, they can pu push your head back there. That was a pretty big if you got there. Well, I'm assuming that you're beating up moderately children. sized children and not very small ones. <laughs> I beat up kids for a living, so I'm all for that. <laughs> I heard you talk yeah. about it. <laughs> they can't reach my filtrum, so I feel pretty good with my whack-a-mole <laughs> hammer fist on top of their head. This is – no, there's no defense for this. <laughs> his, his, whole, his whole kata is this? That's it. <laughs> the windmill effect, yes. I could take out 25-year-olds, <laughs> lickety-split. <laughs> it always brings up the Seinfeld episode. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Have you not seen that? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, great. Right. Uh, there was a, uh, an app in the early days of Facebook that was like, how many five-year-olds can you beat in a fight? <laughs> All of them. <laughs> well, the, the numbers, I mean, they got really big. It was, you know, you saw people posting results like, I could take 39 five-year-olds. <laughs> what? Is that a thought exercise we really need to have? It's not. It's not. And I, I want, <laughs> let's switch. Jared, what else you got on your list there? Um. Well, here's one just because this is something I've been noticing in the last year or two is the state of martial arts entertainment right now. We've been getting a lot more kind of almost retro martial arts movies where the martial arts is the, the point of the movie. I'll put it that way. Uh, we've been having TV series. Netflix has done a couple of them. Uh, it, it seems to be that we're having kind of a, a renaissance of the actual – martial art movie right now is it a renaissance or is it uh, big budget saying you know we can make a martial arts movie really cheap <laughs> well they do like uh, for example the john wick movies right yeah that's not really cheap <laughs> exactly so it the focus is on the martial arts though it so there's a period i'm gonna say uh probably about 2000 on where even though the movies had martial arts, it wasn't the focus of the movie. Right. It, the character was someone who also did martial arts. It wasn't, this is a martial artist as the character. The martial arts drives the story. It drives the action. Correct. And for me, um, I think you're right. And I, I think Crouching Tiger, Hidden Dragon was the turning point, which turned into the Rush Hour series. Mm. And people realized, huh, we can have action and comedy we can have all these other things alongside martial arts it doesn't have to be one or the other and like i said netflix has been um uh what was the one they just had with eco elias um triple something, something assassin the tv oh. three assassins yes that's it that's yeah. it so it, it just seems to be something that i've noticed is that we're we're starting to i hope so we're starting to put that focus back on martial arts. Yeah. Why do, you, why do you hope so, Jeremy? Because for the same reason that you discovered Bruce Lee and started training. Mm. I think that for a certain demographic of people, seeing martial arts in movies and in television is a gateway. And it opens their mind to the possibility of training. I want to be that guy. I want to do that. Because let's face it, we don't have heroes and big name celebrities the way most industries do. All of our big names are, sorry to say, they're old. Yeah, right. You know, you ask person on the street, name some martial artists. They're going to go, Bruce Lee. Okay, he's, he's gone. Chuck <laughs> Norris. And he's doing great, but he just turned 80? Something like that. 84? So he's 
aging out. And who else do we have? Van Damme, Seagal. But again, those are all... But a, a lot of people would, would, I think, would question, are they <clears throat> legitimate martial artists or are they movie actors? You know, many of us know, you know, some of their credibility and, and, and some of what they've done. But I think that they are movie actors first. Bruce Lee, I think, to most people, they would look at him and say, no, that guy's a, a, a martial artist. Even if they don't understand martial arts, I think they understand that there's a different quality to Bruce Lee. And I think that that's why he's endured. And I would like to see some more celebrities. People's, kids start playing football because they watch football and they want to be like their favorite football star in sports. And we see similar things in science. And we, as a pursuit, as a hobby, as a lifestyle, we don't have that. So more movies might equal that. Nah. No? You don't <laughs> think so? There's never been a shortage of martial arts films. Kung Fu Panda comes out. I don't get a line out the door of kids wanting to do Kung Fu or uh, Karate Kid got remade. I didn't get a line out the door of, oh, all these kids suddenly want to do karate. It's just, uh, you know, I'd like to believe that there's that kind of influence. Um, but new Power Rangers movie out, new enrollments? No. And that's why I really don't care about karate being the Olympics. If anything, it makes me upset because <laughs> that's a whole other topic. Um, because there's a big difference between watching something for entertainment value and then participating and thinking sure. you can do it. And for me, martial arts should be something that's for everybody. I want a 60 year old and a five year old and a 20 year old all thinking that's something for me. I want to empower myself. I want to defend myself. I want to feel better in my body and my own psychology. Um, and when you see things only done by special effects people or elite athletes or Olympic gold medalists, then it just looks like, oh, that's just something else I can't do. I'm not, that's mm. not for me. Mm. I love gymnastics. Uh, I watch it every Olympics. It's my favorite. Those people are like superhuman, but I've never once thought about going out to sign up at a gymnastics center and seeing if I can do an iron, <laughs> iron cross on the rings because I know it'll break my arms. So I tried. They're very hard. Yeah, no, I do cross spears. Um, yeah, that's, but you know what I'm saying? So it's like martial arts out in the public eye. It's always been on the public eye. You can go up and down and budgets and that's fine. But it's, everybody always knows what karate is. There's not, that's been around for decades and decades. Everybody knows. And for most part, it's got a good reputation. Oh, that's where you go for discipline and respect. And yeah, yeah, it's got a good reputation, but still, you know, traditional martial arts, maybe feeling like it's a slide. Um, but I don't see like, oh, well, that means that all these boxing gyms are suddenly spiking up all these little kids signing mm -hmm. up to be MMA fighters. You know, you get that couple of 20 year old dudes, you get a little bit hyped up. Like, oh, I, I could do that. But not as many as I think you would, you should see for such a huge sport nowadays. Uh, I think it's a lot of fandom. Like, oh, I, I see that. I like it. It's fun to watch people flipping around on wires in the movies. It's fun to see people get knocked out in the cage, but that's not for me. Mm -hmm. <laughs> that's for actors and that's for elite athletes. And uh, I'm just happy to buy a ticket, but I wish it was something that was really just for regular people only. That would be my dream. Martial arts is like a secret weapon for the nerd, for the underdog, for the person who couldn't make the track team, couldn't make the football team, is not the star. But yet there's some place you can go. That's why I said, like, that's why I knew I couldn't be like Arnold and Sly. I'm seeing all these role models of maildom and they're all jacked up. And um, but I, 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 didn't, I wasn't built like that. I knew I never could be. Um, I tried lifting weights and all that stuff. Nope. That's why Bruce Lee was so intriguing to me. I was like, this guy's the star of this thing. He's skinny. He's small. He's a buck 35 soaking wet, but he's just got attitude. I just like this guy's attitude. Holy smokes. So if a skinny guy who's not even from my country can come over here and be a star and be in control of his body and have that kind of confidence, that's for me. I want that. You know, so I don't, you know, seeing some guy do whack gold medal. Oh, he smacked that guy really fast with a punch. It's like, well, that's not for me. <laughs> <laughs> Fortunately, the Olympics got pushed back a year. So, what's that? The Olympics well, got pushed back a year. So, so there's time for everyone to get there's, on. There's on the time team. to to convince everyone. Absolutely. Well, yeah, I'll, it'll be on. It won't get covered. Uh, that's the other argument. Well, it'll be great for the exposure. People will sign up for Christ. Really? Are there a lot of fencing schools you see popping up everywhere? Are there a lot of? Uh, they took wrestling out. Wrestling yeah. been there since the first Olympics. I don't see kids. Did it go back wrestling. in though, or did it come out again? Either way, no one's watching it. The TV's, right. I, I can't even get coverage of it. ESPN 27, maybe. It's somewhere like in the middle of the night. I tried to watch Taekwondo last time. could barely find it. Um, 
So, you know, yeah. I'm not seeing like this, this, oh, this great exposure we're going to get from Carl. Even Taekwondo Olympics. people don't watch Taekwondo. <laughs> well, <laughs> well, there you go. That's, that's you, interesting. Have you, you, see, you see the new uniforms? For the Olympics? The Taekwondo, yeah. No, I haven't. No. Um, Tinfoil? You know what? You keep talking. I can pull <laughs> this up and I can share it with you. <laughs> I can search on my phone while you're... Well, you, the other huh? people will be able to see it too. Um, you know, kind of tied into that same idea, I think one of the problems, and I don't know if it's uh, universal or it's just American, but we, we definitely have this idea that martial arts is for kids. That it's not something adults do. Traditional martial arts is definitely seen that way, yeah. But again, it's our own fault. It's, it's traditional martial artists. It's their <laughs> own fault. By not really presenting it the right way. The, in, the, in the full spectrum, change your life kind of way. It's just, uh, I remember when I started martial arts, my dad was just like, oh, that's just for knuckleheads. You're like, well, but yeah, but look at this Bruce Lee book. See all the stuff he's talking about, the philosophy and the, the Taoism and all this cool stuff. He's like, no, it's for knuckleheads. The only martial arts I ever knew were just muscleheads trying to punch each other all the time. You're like, oh, okay. Well, that's an interesting image. Now it's gone completely the other way. Instead of dudes in basements, it's kids in the mall. Um, it's such a different image now. And somewhere in the middle was the right way, was the right one. <laughs> yeah, but now, now we apply those uh, knuckleheads punching each other to the MMA part, not to the traditional part. Right. Well, yeah, a lot of, you know, the critics would, right. If you don't see the art in it, you don't get the. Sure. That's too, it's, it's too bad. Uh-oh. Can you see it? Screen sharing. Oh, this is. Can you see this over though. here? Oh, there it is. Oh, wait. It goes um, peanuts. What am I seeing here? I don't know. Can... It, it looks Jedi-ish. <laughs> Are those like. They're like. Those, yoga pants? Basically. <laughs> with pads. With shin pads. Here, uh, I, I... Gotcha. Built into it. So they are covering. That's not just a white mannequin. I mean, those are actually leggings with pads. Yeah, they're, yeah, they're, they're, they're leggings. Yeah, there's some... If you look, there are some interesting images with people wearing them. And, oh. and uh, when, when, they, when it went live... Here, I'll bring it back to, to us. Yeah, I'm seeing some of the other images there. I see. When, uh, oh, wow. when they went live, uh, everyone just assumed it was a joke. They're like, nah, it's not real. It's not real. And then finally... Wow. Look at, Olympic Taekwondo was like, uh, no, that's, that's what we're going to use now. Yeah, like, that's not helping the image. Nope. No. Leotards usually don't help. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. It's, uh, well, that's it. So what's the reasoning? Just so they can see the uh, leg Athletic better? fabrics and, and, and an athletic oh. cut. Oh. Because athletes should be wearing the, you know, modern. Well, why not the top of the, the go box then? Why not do the whole, uh, you know. Because you want to cover as much of that as you can. Um, I, I don't, I don't okay, fully well, understand. I, I looked into it only good. enough to make fun of it. Ooh, that's always a, scene. which is really not a good way to go, but yeah, I'm going to do some research before I figure it out. What's up? <laughs> <laughs> cool. Okay, let, let's, let's ask our, uh, last question here, I guess. Yeah, let's, let's, okay. let's do that. I'm starving. So the last one, now that we're kind of all stuck at home, talking to each other on computers, what is it that you miss most about the in-person training? What do you miss the most? Yeah, from actually Staff being infection. in the dojo. <laughs> oh, I really miss antibiotics. Oh, jiu-jitsu. <laughs> <laughs> oh, ringworm. Um, <laughs> I, I miss the feeling I get when someone throws a technique and they, they slip, they hit me, they hit harder than they mean to. And I know that in that moment, I've sacrificed a bit of my body to their benefit of training. That because they missed and they hit me, because there was a reaction, I know that I'm contributing to their training. Okay, now, now just a minute here, St. Jeremy. Now hold it one second. No, I, it's not. I'm, just I'm, a minute. You. This is without scotch you're talking like that? Yeah. I just love everybody. And I, when they punch me right in the face, it's the best thing It's ironic ever. That, you're, that you're calling me out for being nice and happy. <laughs> That's insane. <laughs> but it's true. No, I, I, I genuinely, I'm not saying I like when they break my nose. Okay. 
but I can't, we got to spar immediately. I got to get out there. I got to get on a plane. I got to get me some maple syrup. You'll, you'll be you'll be quarantined sparring. for two weeks, but you Thank can have you, my sir, garage. I have another. <laughs> well, that's very giving of you, and uh, if if that's that's not the main thing your... that I miss, right? I'm still able to train. I'm still able to you know do stuff on my own. I don't like hurting other people, so the reverse in that equation, I would rather be the one that gets hit too hard than hit someone too hard. Hmm. Um, we have to talk about that, Jeremy. There, there's some stuff in there that we could unpack. Yeah, well, we have to unpack. <laughs> That's a, we're coming back for that. I'm we, right we now. We could unpack that, that for I'm round two. Uh, instead of under the hakama, it's on the couch. <laughs> yeah, I'm writing that one down here. That one. Oh, he, make he, note. He's, he's taking notes. That one I'm coming back to. I'm going to invite Jeremy well, how about you? after this to come how on my you? podcast. And then I'm going to start taunting you with emails that cut right to your very soul about hurting people. I can't wait. Got it. Great. I'm excited. This is where I'm going to put my hood up. And Here we go. Into the, the Sith Lord. Here he comes. I only wear hoodies that can fit my headphones. Look at that. <laughs> That's part of the, the design quality of whistle kick. Uh, no, but the fact that you can wear your helmet. Not that I know why you would want to do that, but you could because I've done it. Oh. Yeah. I, I, f I feel like Kenny from South Park. <laughs> All right. Somebody else answer that question so What's I can make fun of them. Okay. Well, <laughs> and again, my art, you kind of need to. Be, <laughs> so I miss a lot of the feedback from them. Which I guess it's kind of the same thing you're talking about. It's just not the, I don't want to get the hit part of it, but I need the, I can do a lot of solo training. I can do a lot of the body mechanics. But there has to be the, the, the feedback. It has to be there for me to keep advancing in what I'm doing. Yeah. I mean, otherwise, what's the point of all this? Yeah. Right. You've got to have the feedback. That's I what I'm like That's what might... I was saying. Well, no, you're talking about giving feedback to other people. Well, somebody has to. It, it's a, it's a two-way street, right? It's just the question was, which do you miss the most? That you would you miss giving people feedback I really more enjoy than getting helping feedback other for your own progress is the part that I thought was interesting. <laughs> That's all. It's it, there's. I mean, look, I'm a giver. I, I let people beat me up. I, I work with kids. You think I'm? Not, <laughs> of course, I get beat up for a living. Yeah. <laughs> so I get it. The value of being there to help other people through their journey. That's, that's what being a teacher is all about. Yeah. So uh, you miss being a teacher more than you miss being a student. Yes. Mm. That's okay. a much more eloquent way to put that. I like Well, it. no, I, that's, that's. <laughs> no, that's what he said. He just, uh, as opposed to, uh, I like being hit. <laughs> On St. Jeremy's tombstone, it's going to say, I only regret that you can't hit me anymore. <laughs> <laughs> I have a joke. Mine's gonna say, you know, one more time, please. Yeah. <laughs> please I, kick I, over I think, my tombstone. <laughs> I think like the the most shared social media post we've ever put out was um I think it's Kevin Hart doing that face with a meme. <laughs> mm -hmm. And it says that look you give when your instructor says, Okay, one more. Yep. Because that, that's universal. I mean, we, we, we all do that. We've all seen that done. I'm sure you do that with the kids. Okay, one more. All right, one more. Yeah, sure. That's the secret to everything. One more. <laughs> well, I guess on that note. Um... No more. No more. No, it's <laughs> we'll time. We'll call that. It's time. This was fun. Yeah, this Thank was you guys. Thanks for joining. Thank you. I, I appreciate it. And uh, we'll figure out a way to do this again even better. Every night. I got time. Every night till someone gives up. <laughs> and then we're going to talk about you. So don't, don't oh. leave. Oh, that would be an interesting reality show. <laughs> yeah, you start with like 20 people. <laughs> and then there was one. And there was one. It's like, um, this is the last thing I'll, I'll say as a, because it's really appropriate. There's a show, and I forget what channel it's on, but the premise is, you go off to survive on your own. I mean, really hardcore, you know, like you go in the woods with like the clothes on your back and a knife and that's it. And so do a dozen other people. But you've got a phone and you can quit at any time. And the last person out gets like a buttload of money. But you don't know when everybody else is out. <laughs> mm. 
So they don't tell you, oh, this person's out, this person's out. It's not like Hunger Games where they fire off those things and they say, oh, that many people are out. So everybody could be out in two weeks and you spend another three months out there. Oh, my God. Yeah. It's like those uh, soldiers who, after the World War II who were still like defending that island. Yep, and in the Philippines, yeah. Yeah. What was oh it? My God. Uh, Here's a trivia for you. The last Japanese to surrender World War II was 1975. <laughs> oh, gosh. Did they get a buttload of money? <laughs> <laughs> that's, a tough, that's a tough pilot for a new show. <laughs> it's a 30 year show. You're going to love it. <laughs> that's crazy. That's, oh, that's sad, I guess. Oh, man. Anyway. All right. Well, thank you, gentlemen. This has been a thank real you. pleasure. Uh, Lots of I fun. Spend a quarantine with anybody. Well, it probably wouldn't be you guys, but next tier down, it's probably you guys. So I really appreciate this. Time. We're, we're, we right. might be in the second tier. That's great. We're on your <laughs> I've always Got wanted it. to probably be in the second tier of something. There's a whole tier of supermodels that I have to consider first, and oh, then okay. I well, come down I mean, to the guys fair. with the beards. Well, it is uh, LA, fair. so that's right. All right, I'll talk to you guys soon. Thank okay. you. Take Bye. care. Bye. Bye. Bye.